welcome. I'm going to give you a short talk today about voriconazole, its indications, its activity, and how it works, and how we look after patients on therapy. So we're going to go through the mechanism of action of voriconazole. I want you to be familiar with the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drug. Uh, it's important that you're aware of the various indications, doses and contraindications to voriconazole therapy in both adults and children. To, you need to know something about the adverse events uh, which occur with voriconazole and how we address those in normal use. And we also need to understand the role of therapeutic drug monitoring for the, uh, this um, uh, antifungal. So voriconazole is a second generation triazole. Um, its, its chemical structure is fairly similar to fluconazole, but it has very different kinetics. It's got three fluoride atoms on it, and it's uh, now a WHO essential medicine, so this should be in your pharmacy at some point. It binds to the fungal uh, P450 enzyme, uh, Lanostrol C14 alpha demethylase, which is the same target as all the other azoles. Um, it inhibits the conversion of lanosterol to agosterol, and agosterol sits in the fungal cell uh, membrane and is really important, a bit like in our membranes with cholesterol, but fungal membranes have ergosterol. And, um, and, and because the agosterol is not produced, the fungus gets sick and dies. You get this accumulation inside the cell of the 14-alpha uh, methylsterols, and those don't uh, operate appropriately and you often get toxicity inside the fungal cell and the fungus then dies. And we don't have uh, this agosterol synthetic pathway so the, the, the mechanism of action is specific to fungi. This is a diagram of the um, uh, conversion through squalene, squalene 2,3-oxide to lanosterol and this enzyme as I say, is at 14 alpha demethylase, and you eventually produce agosterol at the bottom, uh, which sits in the cell membrane. So, in terms of the spectrum of activity, uh, this uh, uh, voriconazole works against most Candida species, uh, including some fluconazole resistant Candida glabrata, and it also works for Candida cruzii, which is always fluconazole resistant. It has a good activity against Cryptococcus, and, the, and this voriconazole gets into the brain, so that's helpful uh, in some patients in whom you can't treat with other drugs. It has modest activity against the dimorphic fungi, Blastomyces, Coccidioides, and Histoplasma. Uh, it also works for some cutaneous um, dermatophytes and microsporin. But its particular indication is against the moulds and in particular Aspergillus. So it works really well for, against Aspergillus fumigatus and terius and flavus. Um, and it also has some activity against Fusarium and Cetosporium. It doesn't have any activity against the Mucorades, and that's one of the Achilles heels of the drug in terms of the neutropenic patient. So here's a spectrum of activity comparing fluconazole, letroconazole, voriconazole, and posoconazole. And you can see that there are quite a lot of differences between the different drugs. Um, and voriconazole really has its uh, great strength in terms of aspergillus, but it also has this activity against some of the uh, fluconazole-resistant yeasts, which is also particularly helpful. We don't see very much uh, intrinsic resistance to the organisms which are susceptible, um, but we do get acquired resistance, particularly in fluconazole resistant strains of Candida, and so only about half of the Glabrata strains are actually susceptible to voriconazole, and you can get re uh, induction of resistance. And we also have got both idraconazole and voriconazole, but also multi and panazole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. Resistance uh, to voriconazole in Aspergillus niger and flavus and terris appears to be rare. So it is primarily a fumigatus problem. Um, and the resistance mechanism is usually related to a mutation in the 14-alpha demethylase gene, but we've also seen upregulation of efflux pumps, and there may be other mechanisms that are not yet described. So this is given orally or intravenously, and there's both tablets and suspension. And the suspension is useful for children, but also for people who can't swallow very well. The, the tablets or capsules are quite small, um, but uh, some people still can't swallow them. 
and then the intravenous needs to be reconstituted and typically in multivials for patients, particularly with the loading doses at the beginning of therapy. And it's important that nothing else is added to the injection for voriconazole if it's given IV. So the clinical indications which were based on the clinical studies that were done include invasive aspergillosis, particularly treatment, although there is some data on prophylaxis, although it's not universally approved for prophylaxis, it's often used. Invasive candidiasis in non-neutropenic patients, some treatment of some of these fluconazole resistant yeasts, including um, uh, Candida cruzii, esophageal candidiasis, um, some strains and infections caused by Cetosporium and Fusarium, um, and uh, it's really designed for the immunocompromised patient, although we also do use it for patients with chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and some cutaneous, difficult, complex cutaneous infections. The um, <clears throat> landmark study that was completed in 2001 and published in 2002 compared voriconazole with conventional amphotericin, which could be switched to liposomal or lipid-based amphotericin with toxicity to conventional. And this showed a 13% reduction in mortality over 12 weeks, which was the first time anybody has ever demonstrated an improved survival in a randomized clinical trial of, of any fungal infection. And this was the basis of the registration of why voriconazole is the leading drug across the world for invasive aspergillosis. In follow-up data, um, of non-randomized controlled trial data, from the whole of France, you can see that the data from the randomized control trial holds true in ordinary usage in, in patients across, um, across the country. So here, usage of voriconazole alone or with anything else was better than patients who didn't receive voriconazole. And you can see that the survival um, was improved early in the course of treatment, so in the first two weeks. So in, if you've diagnosed invasive aspergillosis, Treating initially with voriconazole is the right thing to do, assuming there aren't contraindications such as drug interactions. So the intravenous uh, dosing requires two loading doses and then a maintenance dose of four milligrams per kilogram. Um, patients who are very elderly and very delicate uh, sometimes would benefit from a slightly lower dose because we do have high levels in older folk. And children need quite large doses as well. Um, and so the dosing in children is very similar to those in adults. The loading dose for patients taking oral therapy is not always used. It depends on the indication. So we, we do use it if we want to get up to good high levels uh, in a patient with, for example, subacute invasive virgilosis or, or cryptococcal meningitis where IV can't be given. But in patients with more chronic diseases, we tend not to use the loading dose only because of the adverse events associated with voriconazole on first usage. And the typical dose is 200 milligrams twice a day. Now in children, you can see that the doses from two years onwards are nine milligrams per kilogram, so much larger than in adults. And then, but, the, but there's a maximum there. And then in, in teenagers, um, it's actually, it depends a little bit on their body weight as to what dose to use. And, but it, again, it's larger doses than would be the case in, in adults. And that's because of a very fast metabolism in children. And the IV doses are very similar to oral, except that you go from 9 to 8 milligrams per kilogram, uh, as opposed to 6 and 4, which is what we do in adults. Um, and if they can't tolerate it, then small dosage steps are required. The drug is, is linear in children, but non-linear in adults, which means that uh, any change in dose in children you, is reflected in linear changes in levels. It, it, but not in adults, where you can get a stepwise increase or reduction depending on uh, change of dose. And this is reflected as well in the, in the IV there with the different, slightly different dosing, adult dosing from in older teenagers essentially, um, whereas it, in children it depends on the, um, uh, on the weight. In younger children it depends on the weight. So the bioavailability of voriconazole following oral administration is very good. So you could argue you don't need to use IV therapy. In reality, for very ill patients, we do use IV therapy, and, um, but you can make a switch to oral early, but when you make that switch, the levels may change dramatically. So it's, if a patient is very tenuous, it's better to keep them on a longer IV course until you know that you've established control of the disease before making that oral switch, even though it's obviously attractive to, do, to, to make an oral switch.
the absorption is not affected by gastric acidity, but it is affected by whether the patient is uh, eating anything or not. And so you get reduced absorption if there's food taken at the same time. It's quite highly protein-bound, much less than itraconazole or posaconazole, and that allows it to get into other spaces uh, like uh, ELF in the lung fluid and in the brain in a slightly better way than it with, um, uh, with the other azoles. So you've got good levels in the CSF, and you also have good levels in the eyes, which is often quite difficult to get levels, and you certainly can't with uh, um, itraconazole, posaconazole, or amphotericin, or the echinocandines, actually. Um, so the half-life varies by in individuals. So you've got a short half-life in some people who are fairly rapid metabolizers and children and young people. And as you get older, or you have liver dysfunction or certain polymorphisms of your um, uh, CYP51 enzymes, you have much longer half-life. And this variability in half-life is why we recommend drug monitoring in the majority of patients. It goes through three different enzyme systems in terms of metabolism, 2C9, 2C19, which is probably the most important, and C3A4. And those enzymes, particularly 2C9, um, are variable from one person to another. And so people from Northeast Asia, so Korea, Japan, and parts of China, may be slow metabolizers, around a rate of around 15%. Um, and whereas Caucasians um, have a rate uh, of, of, of slow metabolism of about 3 to 5%. And we don't know the data for other parts of the world, in Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, and so on. There's almost no drug in urine. So this is not a drug that you can use in patients with urine infections. So this 2C19 polymorphism, which varies, as I've said, between those in Northeast Asia and uh, um, Caucasians, gives you very different uh, levels. And this is a modeling um, where you can see that you get a buildup of levels in the slow metabolizers, and you, then, and, and, it, and you can get into toxicity if you're not careful. And this switch between the, the higher, the peaks and troughs, is relates to the IV to oral switch and what happens to those uh, patients in, in, in that. And then conversely, those who metabolize the drug fast will have low levels and may not have enough drug on board. And so you have a variability of four or five times exposure based on genetics and other factors, age uh, in particular. And when you do look at a sort of modeling of this, you can see that you occasionally get patients who have really high levels. And we really, we try not to have levels more than about five. So you can see this top um, jagged line is taking you up beyond 10, 15. And that's almost certainly highly toxic for the patient. And you have other patients down at the two and one level, and they have quite low levels. And these are the, what we aim for is a trough of approximately two, more than one is adequate for some patients and not more than six because you get more adverse events, particularly confusion states and liver function test abnormalities at that level. And that gives you the graph showing the toxic versus subtherapeutic and that's what you're trying to do is get it into that range. So as I've said, it's very oral bioavailable. Uh, it gets into almost all body compartments including the CSF and I you get this middle-level middle protein binding. You've got this important metabolizer. The principal metabolite, and there are others, is the voriconazole N oxide. And we're suspicious, but it's not been well documented, that in very high concentrations, that itself can be toxic. Um, the, um, the biological half-life is partly concentration dependent, and you, most of the inactive metabolites are excreted in the urine, having been generated by the liver. So if you look at the uh, target therapeutic ranges for uh, drug monitoring for this drug, um, you can see that the range at the bottom for voriconazole is 1 to 5.5. It's because of variability of the timing. Sometimes that varies from 1.3 or 1.5. And if you've got a patient with CNS disease, you really should be aiming a little higher than that. <clears throat> and likewise, patients with difficult organisms, such as cetosporium or uh, fusarium, you want to push the levels up a bit higher than that. But once you get above six, you get this higher toxicity, and that's a problem. And as I've indicated, this is nonlinear kinetic. So if you have a low level and you change the dose, it can jump up quite dramatically. It doesn't go up in a nice linear fashion in adults.
So the reasons for TDM in voriconazole are because of variable absorption, because of nonlinear kinetics, and because of variable elimination. So there's three different reasons why it'd be worth measuring levels. With this target trough of one to two, uh, and the and, and not having a trough more than six. And if you do have trough levels more than six, it's associated with encephalopathy or confusional states, liver disturbance, visual disturbance is common, and you can also get cardiac and electrolyte side effects if the levels are very high, and that's a problem. So um, what we normally do is we measure the level in the first seven days of starting therapy. Um, and, and then we, if, if, if we also, when we switch from IV to oral, then it needs to be re-measured because often the oral dose at 200 milligrams twice daily is too low for patients with life-threatening disease and we actually have to put the dose up. So in a younger person in their 20s, 30s, 40s, we might often use 250 milligrams twice a day with that oral switch, depending a bit on the blood level during the IV phase. Um, also, we need to monitor levels when we change interacting drugs. So omeprazole, lanzoprazole, push levels up, for example, and other um, drugs that increase um, uh, CYP3A4 metabolism, such as carbamazepine, are also can push the levels down. So there's quite a lot of drug interactions with voriconazole, and it's important that those are looked at. Occasionally, you have patients who don't take their medicine, and so you can measure levels for that reason. Um, sometimes we have patients who aren't eating or have um, damaged bowels and uh, don't absorb very well and it's important to measure levels in those patients sometimes. And if we think there's toxicity, so the patient is a bit confused or their liver tests are abnormal or something, then you can measure and actually document whether there is uh, um, uh, high levels and therefore toxicity. So the advice we give to patients is that the high-fat meals reduces absorption. So the, the voriconazole should be taken an hour before or an hour after a meal. And the, um, and it, but it isn't affected by gastric acid, so although, which, which is a problem for itraconazole. So, so although lanzoprazole and um, omeprazole change the levels, it's not because of gastric acid. It's a direct effect on 2C19. The adverse events include uh, nausea, sometimes vomiting, although that's not very common. Hepatitis is relatively common um, and particularly associated with high levels. Um, very common is abnormal vision, a, a sensation of zigzag lines in the eyes or bright lights, usually for an hour or two after taking the medicine and then tailing off. Um, and sometimes patients have such bright lights that they can't go out and, and, uh, uh, in bright lights at all. And some patients have a change in their color vision, and that's an issue. And if this persists or it's very bad, then we have to stop therapy. But usually patients can tolerate it over time. In the skin, over time, in people with um, white or lightly brown skin and exposed to sun, we get photodermatitis. So people with black skin don't tend to get this problem. Um, and it occurs six to 12 weeks after starting therapy. It's associated with dry lips and sometimes dry eyes. And we recommend Factor 50 uh, sun cream for those patients. Um, and you can get this photosensitization even with indoor light, not always external light as well. Mm -hmm. And then rarely there's a whole long list of side effects with voriconazole, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome and other rashes, uh, cholestasis, hepatic failure, and so on, as we get with many other uh, drugs that we use. In children, um, you've got much faster metabolism, as I indicated to you, and so it's even more important to measure levels in children. Occasional children, given these very high early doses, have levels in the toxic range, and some have low levels. So it's, if we can do therapeutic monitoring, it's really helpful in managing voriconazole in children. So because uh, voriconazole is metabolized by the liver, you can get accumulation of levels in patients with liver dysfunction. So these mild to moderate liver dysfunction, the child pew score A or B, uh, which is associated with mild or moderate cirrhosis, usually we just give a normal loading dose, but then the maintenance dose, the standard dose, is half. So you give 200 milligrams once a day, for example, or 100 milligrams twice a day. We don't know what to do in patients with severe liver disease. And severe liver disease is associated with invasive aspergillosis. It's at a rate of around 2-3%. And in those patients, it's 
it's difficult to treat, but it may be the right thing to do to give voriconazole, but again, measuring levels will be helpful, but it will probably not get metabolized very well. And so there's a risk there attached to that. And with liver dysfunction, you get hep hepatitis, you get cholestasis, and you can even get fulminant hepatic failure, as has been described for all of the azoles and occasionally for other drugs as well. The risk appears to be greater in those with hematological malignancy, for reasons I don't completely understand. And so it's helpful to know that the liver function is normal before treatment, and then we tend to do it weekly or alternate weekly, whether they're inpatients or outpatients, uh, for about a month, and then monthly during therapy. Once you get past about six months of therapy, if your patient's on, liver function dysfunction uh, or liver dysfunction is unusual after that time frame. So the monitoring is needed less often at that point. But if the liver tests do become abnormal, then it's important to stop therapy early and not have a patient go into liver failure. So we do need to tell patients of what are the symptoms of, of liver dysfunction, such as nausea, uh, loss of appetite and anorexia, and any, any jaundice at all is an absolute indication to stop therapy. And that's really important. So the phototoxicity that I've referred to is this um, uh, not completely understood. It's not related to the blood levels. It occurs in some patients and not in other patients. And it's very severe in some patients and quite mild in other patients. And we do need to stop therapy over time in some of these patients. If patients are immunocompromised, they've had, for example, they've had a transplant, then this also increases the risk of them getting skin cancer. So skin cancer over many months or years of voriconazole therapy with photosensitivity is uncommon in normal people to the point of being rare. But in transplant patients, it's relatively common and can occur as early as nine months after having photosensitivity. So it's important if patients have that to actually think about switching drugs because otherwise you may end up with a skin cancer. And some of these are quite severe. So the patient's information here should be with those who are white or, or got um, brown skins but light brown skins um, need to avoid intense or prolonged exposure to direct sunlight and to avoid the use of sunbeds, absolutely. Um, and it's important to use a sunscreen with a high protection factor to try to minimize this problem. Um, and some patients t forget, they forget to put it on their feet if they're wearing open-toed sandals, for example. So it, it needs a little bit of reinforcement. And there are leaflets available from the company about this if, you, um, uh, uh, if this is an issue. And you, in association with this, you get this dry eyes, this, um, which is typical, you get very dry lips. And, and that's a, a, a also a problem for some patients. So although the first sensitivity isn't so much of a beard, a deal for them. Dry lips, cracked lips is sometimes so bad that they actually want to come off therapy. This drug doesn't go out through the kidneys, um, but the IV formulation is with cyclodextrin, and cyclodextrin is excreted through the kidneys. So when the company for Pfizer first developed voriconazole, they recommended that they shouldn't use this drug in patients with impaired renal function because it wasn't clear how toxic cyclodextrin actually is. It's now clear that this isn't so bad, cyclodextrin, certainly for a period. And so if patients have got a life-threatening infection with some renal impairment, a short period of IV voriconazole is probably not a problem. Um, but it is a problem, I think, if you, or might be a problem if, if, if extended IV therapy is, is necessary. The tablets and suspension, of course, don't have cyclodextrin, so there's no problem with those in terms of the patients with renal impairment. So overall, this drug is the most effective drug that we've got, apart from Izavuconazole, which seems to be about the same, for invasive aspergillosis. So this is the four patients with this disease, Voriconazole is the drug of choice. Um, it's effective for other fungal infections as well, and it has really good penetration to the brain. So particularly patients with cerebral aspergillosis or other unusual manifestations outside the lung, this is clearly the drug of choice. You've got quite a lot of abnormal events attached to voriconazole, as, you, as I've been talking about with hepatitis and photosensitivity, some change of vision, sometimes confusion or hallucinations, or milder things such as nightmares or funny dreams or not being able to concentrate. You've got lots of drug interactions, and um, there's an app that you can download 
which you, on antifungal interactions to check on those. In adults, you've got nonlinear pharmacokinetics, which makes dose adjustment more difficult than it should be, and there's a lot of variation between patients. And in children, these high doses are required. And it's really much better used if you can manage um, the levels with therapeutic drug monitoring. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that would be helpful for you in terms of using this drug as best you can. Thank you. Thank you.